current events, the ancient past, Bible prophecy. How does it all fit together? Find out now. This is Pictures of the End. Hello, my name is Tim Rumsey and this is Pictures of the End. Recordings of this and previous episodes are available online at picturesoftheend.com. And whether you're listening on the radio, on a podcast, or watching on television, thanks for joining us today. Is the Protestant Reformation finished? Today's show is part three of an eight-episode series dealing with this important issue. In parts one and two, we learned that the fundamental issue being debated in the Protestant Reformation is spiritual authority. Does the Bible or the Pope have ultimate spiritual authority? Related to this was the debate on justification. According to the Bible, the process of justification depends on the spiritual authority of the priest. The Protestant reformers believed that that priest was Jesus Christ, serving in heaven's sanctuary following his resurrection and ascension. The Roman Church taught that justification rests on the presumed spiritual authority of the human priesthood and ultimately of the Pope. Virtually every other doctrine and every church practice argued and debated between Protestants and Romanists during the last 500 years is rooted in the question of spiritual authority. To begin, let's review the basic assumptions on which Protestantism was built. There were five of them, and historically they have often been referred to as the five solas. Sola Scriptura, the Bible alone, Sola Fide, by faith alone, Solus Christus, through Christ alone, Soli Deo Gloria, for God's glory alone, and Sola Gratia, by grace alone. You, of course, recognize the common thread that binds all of these basic assumptions together. The word sola, which means only or alone. Sola Scriptura, then, points to a basic assumption that the Bible alone contains the truths necessary for salvation. In the same way, sola fide reveals the basic assumption that salvation is obtainable through faith alone. Likewise, Solus Christus points to the fact that salvation is available through Christ alone. Now, the Protestant reformers were adamant on this concept of alone, this idea that human salvation is achieved only through faith in Jesus Christ alone, as revealed in the Bible alone. Now, while the reformers agreed on these basic assumptions of the Christian faith, they did have differences of opinion on a number of issues. However, there was one thing that they all agreed on. This belief was a central keystone that, in many ways, held up the other pillars of the Protestant Reformation. Today we're going to look at this aspect of Reformation theology, and it is one that has caused heated debate for centuries. Given the fact that it was so central to the Protestant worldview, it is strange that virtually nobody is talking about this subject today. Even with all the talk about the Reformation being finished, this aspect of Protestantism has nearly been forgotten. In many ways, the Protestant Reformation was unintended. John Wycliffe, Jan Hus, John Calvin, Martin Luther, and countless other reformers were all Roman Catholics who desired to reform the Church. It soon became clear to them, however, that the Church, at least as a whole, was not going to change. When this happened, the Reformers began looking in Scripture for an explanation as to why the Bride of Christ, as the Church refers to itself, refused to return to the simplicity and purity of the Biblical Gospel. What they discovered shocked them. Five hundred years before Jesus Christ was born, two men living in ancient Babylon received dreams, prophetic messages from God. The first was King Nebuchadnezzar. In his dream, he saw a giant statue with a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay. In the dream, a stone flying in from heaven struck the statue and completely destroyed it. The stone then grew into a mountain that filled the entire earth. In the morning, the king knew he had dreamed something important but couldn't recall the details of the dream. Nebuchadnezzar could find only one man in all of Babylon that was able to relate and interpret the dream for him a Hebrew captive named Daniel. 
The next night, God revealed to Daniel that Nebuchadnezzar's dream was a prophecy of earth's future from the time of Babylon until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Daniel told the king, You are this head of gold, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass. The fourth kingdom, which would be strong as iron, would eventually fragment into ten parts represented by the ten toes. The stone, in turn, represented Jesus Christ and the coming kingdom of God. Daniel told the king in Daniel 2.44, In the days of these kings, the ten toes, that is, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Sometime later, Daniel himself received a prophetic vision from God. Like Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel's vision predicted the rise and fall of world empires from his day until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Instead of the four metals in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, however, Daniel saw four animals rising from the sea, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a strange and terrifying beast with iron teeth and ten horns. An angel explained to Daniel that the animals represented the progression of world empires, just like in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The angel tells him in verse 17, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. The beasts pointed not to specific kings, but more generally to kingdoms or empires that those uh, beasts represent. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, Daniel 7.24. Daniel had been given the same information as King Nebuchadnezzar, only with different symbols. These two visions identified four sequential empires between Daniel's day and Jesus Christ's second coming. The first empire was Babylon. Daniel had made this clear when he told Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold. The second and third empires were identified by name and yet another vision recorded in Daniel chapter 8. Now in this third dream, a ram and a goat replaced the beasts of prey in Daniel 7, but the sequence of world empires remained exactly the same. The angel Gabriel told Daniel, the ram which you saw, having two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia and the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. History reveals the amazing accuracy of Daniel's prophecies. Babylon fell to the Medo-Persian Empire in 538 BC, when Cyrus's army drained the Euphrates River and marched under the gates of Babylon. Persia, in turn, fell to Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire at the Battle of Arbela in 331 BC, and Greece fell to the growing Roman Empire in 168 BC at the Battle of Pydna. The historian Paul K. Davis writes of this battle, Pydna marked the final destruction of Alexander's empire and introduced Roman authority over the Near East. Christians have understood this historical fulfillment of Daniel's prophecies for centuries, even thousands of years. And it has been the unanimous consent of countless Bible scholars that the fourth empire of Daniel chapters 2 and 7 represents Rome. Hippolytus, who was born less than a hundred years after the disciple John died, wrote about Daniel's prophecies. The golden head of the image and the lioness denoted the Babylonians. The shoulders and arms of silver and the bear represented the Persians and Medes. The belly and thighs of brass and the leopard meant the Greeks who held the sovereignty from Alexander's time. The legs of iron and the beast dreadful and terrible expressed the Romans, who hold the sovereignty at present. Martin Luther also recognized this prophetic sequence and identified the fourth beast with iron teeth as the Roman Empire. He wrote this, We must not hold and understand allegories as they sound. As what Daniel says concerning the beast with ten horns, this we must understand to be spoken of the Roman Empire. Now, unlike the earlier empires of Daniel's prophecies, the Roman Empire was never conquered in a single battle. Instead, it slowly weakened over the course of several centuries until the year 476 AD, the year generally accepted by historians to mark the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Now, the Eastern Roman Empire centered in Constantinople survived for another 1,000 years after the fall of the Western Empire. In this year, 476 AD, the Germanic ruler Odoacer deposed the boy king Romulus Augusta, the last emperor of the Western Roman Empire that had been centered in Rome. 
And after this event in 476 AD, Europe was no longer under the control of Rome, but actually fragmented into ten tribes, or ten people groups, represented by the ten toes of Daniel 2, or the ten horns of Daniel chapter 7. The famous American evangelist Dwight Moody wrote in his book, Men God Challenged, about this division of Daniel's fourth beast. Then came the Caesars and founded the empire of Rome, symbolized by the legs of iron, the mightiest power the world had ever known. And for centuries Rome sat on those seven hills and swayed the scepter over the nations of the earth. And then, in its turn, the Roman power was broken, and the mighty empire split up into ten kingdoms corresponding to the ten toes of the prophetic figure. Now, one aspect of the fourth iron beast that really bothered the prophet Daniel was a little horn that arose from among the ten European kingdoms after the division of the Western Roman Empire. He wrote, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. That's from Daniel 7, verse 8. This little horn would be different from the fourth beast's other ten horns. But how? Well, the angel explained to Daniel that this little horn would become exceedingly great and seek to expand its territory even to the host of heaven, Daniel 8, verses 9 and 10. It would cast truth down to the ground and speak pompous words against the Most High. In other words, the little horn power would be different from normal political powers or horns because it would also exhibit religious characteristics and claim spiritual authority. Now, the early Christians understood these prophecies, and they identified the little horn power with another ominous character in Bible prophecy, the Antichrist. Hippolytus again wrote, The other little horn that grows up among them, that is, among the ten horns of the fourth beast, meant the Antichrist in their midst. Now, even though the word Antichrist appears only in the short letters of 1 John and 2 John, it's actually described under numerous names in both the Old and the New Testament. These names include the Little Horn of Daniel chapters 7 and 8, the Beast Power of Revelation 13, and in 2 Thessalonians 2, the Man of Sin, the Son of Perdition, the Mystery of Iniquity, and the Lawless One. The Bible also identifies Jesus Christ by many names, and since anti means both in place uh, and against, it is not surprising that prophecy identifies this menacing power in different ways. Its numerous names simply reflect, reflect different aspects of its character, just as Christ's many names reflect different aspects of His character. In 1 John 2 verse 18, John states, Even now many antichrists have come. And then he says something even more surprising, They went out from us. In other words, according to the Bible, the antichrist power involves more than just one person and it actually emerges from within Christianity. The Apostle Paul agreed. He wrote that the man of sin would arise through a falling away from biblical Christianity. It seems hard to believe, but the little horn or Antichrist power actually arises from within Christianity. Now, Paul went on to explain that even as he was writing his letter, another power was preventing the Antichrist from arising. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth, or restrains, will let or restrain until he be taken out of the way." Now, the early Christians understood exactly what Paul meant. Augustine wrote, It is not absurd to believe that these words of the apostle, only he who now holdeth, let him hold until he be taken out of the way, refer to the Roman Empire. Remember, the little horn power emerges after 476 AD, when the fourth beast, the Roman Empire, fragments into ten pieces. Tertullian, another early Christian, wrote this, He who now hinders must hinder until he be taken out of the way. What obstacle is there but the Roman state, the falling away of which, by being scattered into ten kingdoms, shall introduce Antichrist? Clearly, the early Christians were familiar with the prophecies of Daniel and Paul and realized that the pagan Roman Empire, though cruel to Christians in many ways, also acted as a deterrent to the emergence of the Antichrist power. 
Now, according to Daniel's vision, this little horn would arise after the fourth beast, Rome, divides into ten parts. Again, Daniel writes, I was considering the horns, and there was another one, a little horn, coming up among them. The little horn, or Antichrist, would arise after the division of the Roman Empire. Paul also predicted that the Antichrist would sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, contrary to popular opinion, this does not mean that the Antichrist power will sit in a literal temple in Jerusalem. The Greek word translated as temple in this verse is nous, and in his writings, Paul consistently and exclusively uses that word to describe not a building, but the Christian church. In his book, End Time Delusions, Steve Wolberg writes this, Let's allow Paul to interpret Paul. Did Paul use the same word anywhere else in his writings? Yes. In his letter to the early Corinthians, Paul wrote to the church of God which is at Corinth. Then he inquired, Do you not know that you are the temple or nous of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Here, Paul clearly applied the word nous to the Christian church, not to a physical temple in Jerusalem. He did the same thing in his letter to the Ephesians. Writing to the saints who are in Ephesus, Paul said they were all growing into a holy temple or nous in the Lord. In fact, in all of his writings, Every time Paul used the word nous, he always applied it to the Christian church and never to a rebuilt Israeli temple. What does it mean that the Antichrist sits in the church or in the temple of God? Well, when Jesus returned to heaven, he sat down on the right hand of God, according to Hebrews 10 verse 12. And he told his disciples that at the second coming, they would see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Matthew chapter 26, verse 64. Both of these passages point to the position and power that Jesus Christ possesses. To sit, therefore, can mean to assume a position of authority. And according to Bible prophecy, the little horn will emerge from within Christianity in Europe sometime after the fall of the Western Roman Empire in 476 AD. It will assume both political and religious power, and after falling away from Bible truth, it will assume authority over the church. As Martin Luther and the other reformers studied these prophecies, they reached a unanimous conclusion. The little horn or Antichrist power could be none other than the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the statements that we are about to read are probably not considered politically correct today, but it is historical fact that this is what the reformers believed. Now, it is well to remember that many of the Protestant reformers were originally Roman Catholics themselves, and their statements were not made against individual Catholics, but rather in reference to a religious system and institution that they believed had slowly drifted from the truth of God's Word. More importantly, these statements were penned from a desire to call people back to the Bible, back to Bible truth, and a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. So what did they say? Martin Luther wrote, we are here of the conviction that the papacy is the seat of the true and real Antichrist. John Calvin wrote, Some persons think us too severe and censorious when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. I shall briefly show that Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians 2 are not capable of any other interpretation than that which applies them to the papacy. Thomas Cranmer, another reformer, wrote, Wherefore it followeth Rome to be the seat of Antichrist, and the Pope to be the very Antichrist himself. I could prove the same by many other scriptures, old writers, and strong reasons. Cotton Mather wrote, The oracles of God foretold the rising of an Antichrist in the Christian Church, and in the Pope of Rome all the characteristics of that Antichrist are so marvelously answered, that if any who read the scriptures do not see it, there is a marvelous blindness upon them. And the Westminster Confession of Faith stated this, There is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition, that exalteth himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. Again, these are not his, uh, politically correct statements today, but it is historical fact that the Protestant reformers believed this. In fact, this understanding of the papacy's uh, prophetic identity 
in many ways provided a foundation for the Protestant Reformation. Henry Grattan Guinness, a Protestant writing in the late 19th century, wrote in his book Romanism and the Reformation. To the Reformers, Rome was the Babylon of the Apocalypse and the Papal Pontiff, the predicted man of sin. Separation from the Church of Rome and from its pontifical head was regarded by them as a sacred duty. To them, separation from Rome was not separation from Christ, but from Antichrist. This was the principle upon which they began and prosecuted the work of the Reformation, the principle which directed and supported them and rendered them invincible. Interestingly, the Protestant Reformers were not the first to express concern about the spirit of Antichrist that obfuscated Christ's priestly authority in heaven with that of a human priesthood on earth. Around the year 600 AD, when the Patriarch of Constantinople assumed the title of Universal Priest, Pope Gregory the Great shared his concern in a letter to the Emperor. Here's what he wrote. Whoever calls himself or desires to be called Universal Priest is in his elation the precursor of Antichrist, because he proudly puts himself above all others. Nor is it by dissimilar pride that he is led into error, for, as that perverse one wishes to appear as God above all men, so whosoever this one is who covets being called the sole priest, he extols himself above all other priests. Now, despite Pope Gregory's warning, the Pope of Rome himself eventually assumed the title of universal priest. And he also eventually claimed the absolute authority accompanying that position. It was this claim to absolute spiritual authority that the Reformers so verbally and passionately protested. They could not reconcile these claims with the Bible's identification of Jesus Christ as the one having supreme authority. They could not harmonize the authoritative claims of a human priesthood with the Bible's description of Jesus Christ as the one having absolute authority in heaven and on earth. And so, they protested. But today, many people both Catholics and Protestants, are declaring that the Reformation is over. Yet nobody is talking about this aspect of the Reformation. And it's not hard to understand why. This is a sensitive and controversial and even inflammatory topic. But at the end of the day, the Reformers either were correct or they were incorrect in their prophetic understanding. They were either visionaries or they were rebels. They either had found the truth or they had rejected it. At the end of the day, either Jesus Christ has supreme spiritual authority, or He has granted that authority to a human representative on earth. In Isaiah 48, verse 11, God says this, For mine own sake, even for my own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted, and I will not give my glory to another? The Reformation was, more than anything else, a struggle about spiritual authority. And while many Protestants and Catholics are applauding recent agreements about how justification works, nobody is talking about spiritual authority. Now, we're about out of time today, but I want to leave with you one final thought. The prophecies of Daniel identify the little horn as an entity that possesses spiritual and political power. As the Reformers looked at the papacy of the Middle Ages, they realized that it did indeed have both spiritual and political power. How did a church gain such tremendous political power? How did it obtain its power over civil society? Well, the story is a fascinating one, and we're going to take a look at it in the next episode. This is the third of an eight-episode series dealing with the question, Is the Reformation Finished? This entire series is available on CD and DVD, and also in my new book titled, Is the Reformation Finished? Here is how you can learn more and get your copy of these resources. Is the Protestant Reformation finished? Was it simply a passing family feud within Christianity, an insignificant historical footnote with little relevance to modern life? Is Christianity destined to reunite? 
Find the answers to these questions and more in the new book, Is the Reformation Finished? by Tim Rumsey. Available at major booksellers, Is the Reformation Finished? shows how today's rapid religious movements are fulfilling Bible prophecy. Learn what is really going on within Christianity right now and where the Bible says these movements will lead. If you would like a copy of today's broadcast, CD and DVD sets of this series are also available. To get your copy of Is the Reformation Finished? Use offer code PICTURES online at picturesoftheend.com or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. Call 855-HIS-TRUTH. That's 855-447-8788. We have seen an amazing panorama of Bible prophecy today. In Daniel chapter 2, God reveals the future history of the world all the way from 500 years before the time of Christ until the second coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds of glory. That head of gold represented the Babylonian Empire, which was uh, succeeded by the chest and arms of silver, which was the Medo-Persian Empire. The Greek Empire came next, represented by the uh, belly and thighs of brass, and then the legs of iron, representing Rome. And Christians, really throughout all of history, recognizing this, writing about this, a testimony in history as well as in Scripture and Bible prophecy. That iron of Rome extends all the way until the very end of time. As the image moves into the feet, that uh, iron is mixed with clay, and yet some element of Roman power and authority remains until Jesus Christ returns. Jesus is re uh, described as that rock that strikes the image from outer space. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 34 says, Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, that were of iron and clay, and break them in pieces. And then what happens next? The Bible doesn't leave us to wonder. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 43 says, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And then verse number 44, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Jesus is coming back soon in the clouds of glory. And when he does, the kingdoms of this world will be destroyed. Where is your heart? Have you given your heart to the King of kings and the Lord of lords? I pray that you have. He is the most trustworthy rock that you can ever find. Thank you for joining us today. I hope that the time spent in God's word has been a blessing to you. And remember, the Bible is God's word to you today. Material in today's episode was taken from the book Is the Reformation Finished? by Tim Rumsey. All rights are reserved and material is used by permission of Teach Services Incorporated at www.teachservices.com. Pictures of the End is a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. Pictures of the End is available via your favorite podcast service and also at www.picturesoftheend.com. Thank you for your support of this ministry.